Welcome, everyone, to the Committee of uh, Education Administration. And why don't we go ahead and call the roll. Representatives Baum, Carringer, Cassida, Sapicki, Here. Clemens, Cochran, Here. Darby, Here. Gillespie, Here. Hakeem, Here. Haston, Here. Lafferty, Here. Love, Here. Parkinson, Reagan, Here. Vice Chairman Hurt, Here. and Chairman White. Here. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Committee, anyone have any announcements or comments you want to make before we begin our, our session? Seeing uh, members, I thank you for being here today. We we won't be in here long. We we do not have any legislation or bills uh, before us, but we do have two excellent presenters that they want to share things with the education committee of what is going on in their field, and we uh, like to give their attention. So we're going to start out first with Arts Ed Tennessee, Mr. Stephen Coleman. Uh, if you will come up to the microphone, you know the drill on, on this. You uh, uh, either one. Yeah, that's fine right here, right in front of you. And there will be a microphone. Just make sure the button is on. Uh, the red light comes on so we can hear. And once you see, just identify your name and who you're with for our audiovisual streaming. And you may have a seat and you may begin. You don't have to stand up. No, thank you. Appreciate it very much. Okay, members, uh, let's give our attention to uh, Mr. Stephen Coleman. Stephen Coleman, Arts Ed, Tennessee. I, How's that? Thanks. Yes, sir. You may begin. I want to thank Chairman White and the committee for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Stephen Coleman, and I'm the president of Arts Ed, Tennessee. With me from Arts Ed Tennessee on the other side of the table is Tabor Stamper, former CEO of KHS America, which is one of the world's top musical instrument manufacturers and has its corporate headquarters in Tennessee in, at Mount Juliet. Arts Ed Tennessee is a 501c3 charitable nonprofit that represents all K-12 arts education content areas. We work to advance, promote, and support music, visual art, dance, and theater in Tennessee schools. Our core member organizations include all of our state's primary arts education associations for teachers, plus a statewide coalition of arts education advocates that consist of community leaders, businesses, and parents. As our state's only arts education policy and advocacy organization that represents all arts disciplines, Arts Ed Tennessee works to ensure supportive policies and essential funding to advance high quality arts education for all students in Tennessee. Like all of you, we at Arts Ed Tennessee understand how important the arts are in our state. They strengthen our economy, spark innovation, and improve the academic achievement and well being of our students. Arts Ed Tennessee stands ready to work with the General Assembly to keep the arts strong in our schools. Joining in today's presentation is CMA Foundation Board of Directors member, Stephen Parker. Stephen is Vice President of Public Affairs at Generator, a venture funder and network of startup accelerators that creates opportunities for music, art, and entrepreneurs across the nation. Prior to his work with Generator, Stephen directed intergovernmental and congressional affairs at the National Governors Association. He served as liaison between governors and federal government and led education, labor, economic development, and workforce policy development. Stephen is a strong supporter of arts education in our schools. You recognize, sir, it is also state your name for the video record. Uh, Stephen Parker, uh, Country Music Association Foundation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I am the son of a piano teacher. Uh, I am uh, someone who, uh, whose first uh, exposure to music education was in the recording studio at the Opryland Mall where you would pay $10 to record your, your, your voice with the soundtrack. And honestly, that has stirred my passion for music, but it's also stirred my passion for your state 
Um, it is a tremendous honor to serve as a member of the board of directors at the Country Music Association Foundation. The Country Music Association Foundation for the past 10 years has been a national grant making organization. They have invested $27 million in music education among the highest amounts invested by any organization in music education across the country. Um, of that 27 million, 17 million of that 27 million has gone directly back in to uh, music education programs within Tennessee at your schools. Um, we are known for CMA Fest, which is one of the lar largest country music events in the world, um, but it also doubles as the largest fundraiser for music education in the world and that the proceeds from CMA education. Our model is building community, um, convening stakeholders, finding data, and making sure we're inform, and, uh, informing and educating just like we are today. Um, we're most proud of uh, a, a new initiative that uh, we launched about four years ago, starting with the Haslam administration and continuing in with the Lee administration called State of the Arts. State of the Arts was an effort by CMA to make sure that uh, school districts across the state outside of the Nashville area that have received a lot of support for music education started to receive resources on music education for music education. That includes musical equipment, that includes high quality instruction materials, and it also included us collecting data on a voluntary basis about where music education is available and where it's not. Um, the eight school districts that we went to in 2018 uh, were essentially, uh, the they, they encompassed 20% of the student population in the state. Based on what we found there, we, we know, knew that there were extreme gaps among those 20% of students. We then expanded our work to collect data statewide um, to figure out where the gaps are. And uh, in 2019, um, we started a pilot program with Mr. Holland's Opus here in the city of Nashville. And last year, that pilot program expanded uh, statewide uh, to essentially allow any school that voluntarily wants one a needs assessment about how well their arts organizations are, are how well their arts programs are doing in their uh, in their schools and how um, they can improve upon those arts programs. The reason that we're here is because of what we found in that data. What we found in that data is that arts education is extremely impactful for mental health. Mental health is one of the largest, most significant challenges that are facing every single school district across this country. Uh, I, we saw in Tennessee, we saw in my home state of Virginia, when school returned this year, there were fights breaking out. There were emotional issues, there were breakdowns, more than we've ever seen before. Uh, mental health issues in schools is not anything new. Um, we saw mental health issues for a variety of reasons before the pandemic, but students being at home for so long with very few academic and and really friend supports and, and educator supports cause them great harm. And that's not just me saying that, that's not the news media saying that. Last month, the Journal of the American Medical Association came out and said that students were harmed possibly for years, um, given how long they stayed at home and how long uh, at home instruction lasted. We believe that arts education and music education is a solution to this. And we don't just believe it because we're advocates for arts education. We believe it because there is significant research, both academic and practical, that says that arts education can improve mental health. Arts in general can improve mental health. In the past year, as, as in since May of last year, reports have come out from the Education Commission on the States, a federal agency, CASEL, uh, Mar the state of Maryland, the state of Arizona, the National PTA, Americans for the Arts, and Syracuse University that all say that arts in schools can help address the mental health crisis. We also know that arts in schools can, can address the issues that are facing you all today outside of mental health, teacher retention. Um, there was a book released in October all about how, or how the arts can save education. And in that book was a chapter on how the arts are increasing uh, the want of teachers to stay in schools and stay in their careers. We also know that art can help, uh, art education can help when it comes to performance and other subjects, including literacy and math. If I'm a good lobbyist, uh, I'm going to leave you with a story. 
And that story is about uh, someone uh, here in the Nashville area, area. Her name is Bella. Bella in 2018 was a third grader. She enrolled in a music education program in her school. She was shy. She was scared to stand in front of her uh, classmates when she wasn't singing, let alone when she was singing. And she was, uh, she had a lot of anxiety due to bullying uh, that was happening due to what uh, her fellow students were saying about her weight. But her music teacher noticed that she was very loud and proud when she sang. And uh, she uh, essentially started to come out of her shell. So much so that she became a star pupil in her class and she got a lot of attention. And who you see before you now is Bella um, on the screen. This is Bella performing in front of 50,000 people at Nissan Stadium during the Country Music Association Fest. This is Bella who overcame her anxiety. This is Bella who overcame the mental difficulties that faced her due to the challenges of her school. And this is Bella before the pandemic. And Bella continues to do music to this day. Students like Bella across the state of Tennessee can have the same experience in arts education that Bella did. Except right now, we know from the data that we're collecting from, with your State Department of Education that there are 78, excuse me, 38,000 students that are not able to access arts and music education as we speak in this state. So we would encourage you all to work with us. We would go on school visits um, to arts and music education programs with you at any point. Um, we just would ask that we, this would be the start of the conversation and not the end of it. We appreciate your service. We appreciate the sacrifices you make, and we appreciate the time to speak to you today. Thank you so very much. That was very well said. And members, do you have uh, do a third guest have anything to comment? Or? Okay, okay. Any uh, one want to? Yes, sir. Representative Hakeem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, uh, to me, you set in a, a higher standard that I've seen in some foundations. You, you're not just looking, you're not just throwing money at so-called problems. You're investing in understanding and sharing that understanding with others of the needs of many people. Uh, some people can see, but in my view, you all have a vision that improves the lives of so many people. And I just wanna thank you so much for the vision and the willingness to improve the lives of others. Thank you. Thank you. Other, yes, Ms. Revson Carringer. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, from being from Knoxville, Tennessee, representing District 16, the home of Kelsey Ballerina, who was at my alma mater high school, and a home of Kenny Chesney, who was Gibbs High School, which was maybe two miles from where I grew up and from where I live to this day. So, uh, uh, my family is very much involved in music and um, and arts and from serving on Knox County Commission uh, for for several years. I just want to say thank you also. Uh, I totally support arts and music. It's unfortunate that uh, that sometimes the first cut that happens in our local governments when it comes to education and monies is that arts and and music and all are the first ones that they cut back on so uh, just to to let you know that i 110 percent support you and i have to i guess throw out a shout to wivk the number one nation country uh, <laughs> radio station so i just wanted to say thank you all and that i i love country music and and i love music and arts so i totally uh, appreciate you all being here and taking the time and investing uh like my colleague just mentioned thank you let me add to that that's one reason i wanted them to come before the committee to remind us we're talking right lot right now with legislation on mental as you say mental health is before us in our schools every day and we're asked to uh 
you know, add more nurses, more counselors, more mental health specialists. Just don't forget that the arts is a big part of that. And so thank you so much for your presentation. It's very well, very well delivered. Anyone else members? Yes, sir. Chairman Haston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just glad to have a, a fellow Indiana uh, Hoosier grad here. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you all very much. And we'll bring up our next, next guest now. And anytime you need us, please reach out. Uh, let's bring up our jobs for Tennessee graduates, Mr. John Dreyer. Once you're situated, just uh, make sure your mic's on and for our AV presentation, make sure you say, state your name and who you're with. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You may pass those out. And slides are in the dashboard. Fantastic. I think I know how to work one of these things. You let me know. We're good. Okay. You may begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Vice Chairman, distinguished members of this committee, thank you for the invitation to learn a bit more about jobs for Tennessee graduates. Probably the most successful Tennessee educational success story none of you really know much about, and that's about to change. Uh, I won't bury the lead. Part of my mission is to make sure that there's awareness that you may be so impelled to go back to your districts and spread the good word of this righteous mission, Jobs for Tennessee Graduates, so that it can be in more high schools in your districts. And the fact that we've had appropriation the last few years and then COVID hit, and we've been very fortunate to uh, receive GEAR funding, Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. That's been fantastic. We also have school districts that invest private foundations and grants, so we're a diverse funding formula as a nonprofit. So I'm John Dwyer with Jobs for Tennessee Graduates, JTG. That is a state affiliate of Jobs for America's Graduates, JAG. In 1981, then Governor Lamar Alexander brought the JAG model from Delaware to Tennessee to curb the dropout rate. Up until 2013, it was run and housed in the Department of Education, funded by the Department of Ed Education and labor funding. And then in 2014, we transitioned to a 501c3 nonprofit. I want you to think about your favorite teacher in high school. And you're all nodding. You all have that vision. You smile when you think about that person. And I hope I'm not putting Representative Haston on the spot, but uh, Representative Haston, who would be your favorite teacher, not coach, Favorite teacher at Perry County High School? My favorite teacher growing up was, of course, my mother, Patty Kirk Haston. I will say yeah, that, that was good that answer. Was, that was fifth grade English. I did call her Miss Patty and not mom. She, and uh, at the high school, I would say it would uh, probably be um, Blake Skelton, our uh, math teacher. Does Mickey Williams factor into that equation? Uh, Mickey Williams, uh, told me today that if I didn't say her name, she would be irate. And I totally just forgot that she texted me earlier today <laughs> and, and she will be playing this when I get back to school on Friday. So, uh, so yeah, she totally will call me out on that, but yeah, Mickey Williams, definitely top five. I'm saying that on purpose. No, she's, she was one of my favorites when I was there. She also taught chemistry and math and you're not going to get that a change from a B you're so stop hassling her about that if you could you're recognized thank you chairman Watt. um she uh she was always um she always had the best field trips uh and so we, we always wanted to get in her class for that but if anybody can make chemistry fun they deserve to be recognized so I'm glad that you brought her up and she did do that <laughs> thank you representative Haston. she is now a JTG specialist and has done wonders so she's a favorite teacher also a testimonial, Najee Madsfield. Najee in 2013 was a sophomore at Stratford High School here in Nashville. And as a sophomore, she was contemplating suicide. She has a mentally ill parent. Her father left and her mother also suffers from addiction. 
her senior year, she was in the JTG program, and Eric Polk was her favorite teacher. He set sights for her and goals for her, and she achieved them spectacularly. She had plans. She worked a full-time job at a local fast food restaurant to make money, worked her way up to Walgreens, was able to get that job because of jobs for Tennessee graduates. And I'll tell you the payoff of what she's doing now in just a moment. If you see on the slide, institutions feel like they turn out people who are employable, young people who are employable at an 89% rate, likely to be employable. You ask employers that same question, it's 11%, a huge disconnect. Make no mistake, we will graduate seniors in Tennessee. And in a broad brush, that's great, nearly 90%. But also employers tell us over and over that these young people are not employable. They don't have a plan. They don't have an edge after high school. But the folks in JTG do. What do JTG specialists do? Well, they're full-time teachers that go in for one credit course general elective teaching the 37 employability competencies, things like job interview skills, conflict resolution, getting along with your coworkers, dress etiquette, also leadership and community service, all the soft skills, we call it essential skills that are lacking in today's workforce. Oh, and the number one reason why young people are not employable, they can't pass a drug test. The 2021 class, the statistics, we keep stats on the seniors along with a 12 month follow-up after graduation. So we have measurable, complete, accurate data. A 99% graduation rate, that's fine. But more importantly, that 92% positive outcomes. Folks either going to full-time work, about a third of our students go right off the stage into full-time employment. And by the way, that's good. They're a taxpayer but also there's a hybrid of post-secondary education and also part-time or full-time work. And our students earn college scholarships. We don't just stress get a job. We say get a career, $5.2 million awarded in post-secondary education. Those are the numbers in 2021. The numbers in 2020, if you go back to the high school seniors that had a nightmare of a 2020 senior year, that went to school in March and never saw their folks again, never returned to the school, virtual graduation, the numbers are nearly identical. JTG, the JAG model, is actually better during the pandemic than normal times. When I hit results, when I run the data, you flinch because you don't know what you're going to get. It has been remarkable. Next slide, please. Do I do it? Yeah. If you got the button there, you can. Uh, there you go. So there's where we are. There's the footprint. 23 high schools, 17 counties. We should be in 123 counties or uh, high schools. If you are in blue, you have a you have a program there. Red is distressed. Certainly, we want to go where the students need the most support. And if you're gold, we want to be there too. 147 school districts, 485 public schools, and we're in 17. We need awareness and we need absolutely to have superintendents, principals know about this program. The funding formula is simple. If you invest in this position and it can be anywhere between 40 and $70,000, your first investment is $7,000. The next year it's 10, we cap it at 15. You get a full-time teacher dealing with at-risk students, graduating them at a high rate and giving them a plan after high school for $7,000. When we launch programs, new programs like in Decatur, uh, Riverside and Westwood in Memphis, they look at the value and say, we will take that all day long. I'm not asking for the state to pay for this program. I'm asking for them to return it, uh, have, a, have an investment in it. The return on investment is undeniable. They pay back, the young people that become taxpayers pay this back in a matter of months. 
So they can either live off of state and federal programs, which Najee was destined to do, or you can be Najee who goes and becomes the valedictorian of her class at Stratford, earns a Bridges to Belmont scholarship worth nearly $300,000, graduates in 2015, then goes and graduates college, and then goes and gets her master's at Samford, and who is now currently working for the United Way of Central uh, Alabama. She's a success story, but she would have fallen through the cracks. JTG lifts young folks up. So I implore you, let's find more favorite teachers because they make a difference. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dreyer. Members, any uh, questions you have? Uh, get, yes, Representative Karen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, so this is the first that I've heard about your program, and, and obviously I see Knox on there as a target county. I guess I'm asking, um, is is this something that you all, that our Knox County School Board could invite you to come and do a presentation or to, to get this in so that Knox County School Board and administration knows, which I'm sure they've heard and they know of it. So I guess I'm asking just maybe for all of us or whatever, what, um, what is, do you go to these different counties and do presentations for, for school boards and all in order to, to help get this word out? Thank you for asking. Absolutely. That's the opportunity I want. Uh, governor Bill Lee serves on our national board. He's one of 14 governors, eight Republicans, six Democrats. This is an apolitical nonprofit organization. I would love that opportunity. I've gone to toss conventions. I have sent emails. It shouldn't be this hard for a program that with these results, especially during a population that's falling through the cracks, that will be devastated, wrecked. You talk about mental health. We deal with trauma-informed care. These teachers know the nuances of dealing with students that have trauma in their life. And we can only imagine what it's been like for them the last 18 to two years. I would love that opportunity to get in front of Knox. We used to be in Austin East, used to be in a few other schools there. And they're all like, what, what happened to that program? Well, <clears throat> we need to you know, certainly find the funding, but to be clear, it's a diverse funding source. But yes, in, in short order, if anybody here could do that, I will be there tomorrow. Thank you, members. Anyone else? Oh, Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Walter Wire, good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, I enjoyed our meeting uh, earlier this week. Thank you for um, your time. I just want to ask two questions. Um, first, could you just go into, I see some of your corporate sponsors in this little brochure here. Mm -hmm. Can you go over just where some of your uh, funding comes from, uh, non-governmental funding, that is? Uh, AT&T, HCA, uh, Regions. Uh, we have... Uh, employed a grant writer go, to go for uh, uh, Bank of America, uh, Comcast, um, uh, Unum down in Chattanooga, where we have two programs, Ivy Academy and CGLA. Um, but it's very important to be sustainable that we secure a lot more, and I mean heavy yardage, heavy big chunks of yardage uh, from from private, they, there must be private investment, and we're much more aggressive this year. Part of the sustainability and the recurring, uh, Representative Gillespie, is we didn't know in the spring whether we were going to be around the next year. As we're on these, you know, one year contracts, I have no issue with proving to say we do we do what we say we do, but the recurring would allow us to be sustainable and allow us to uh, have more confidence with with private corporations to invest in us in a 25, 50, $100,000 level, and then go after matching grants so that they feel like that's a great return on investment. We also, by the way, create an employer engagement model. One example that, that we have proposed in Greene County at West Green High School next to John Deere is to have John Deere uh, go after a grant there, and then they would have a John Deere day the first Tuesday of every month where they'd come in, 
speak or there's a guest tour. Maybe they bring in fin financial responsibility with a, with a bank partner. So they own that program. Get them, you know, it's wonderful to write a check. It's, it, you get so involved. Comcast came into Maplewood a few years ago, an HR person, and hired four people right off the graduation stage because she was so impressed at how they did the mock interviews. And these are students who in August hadn't a clue what they were going to do for a living. They walked out with $15 an hour after graduation and full benefits. Yes, sir, follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much. I just wanted to make sure you you emphasize that because we touched a little bit of that but given my background in nonprofit development. I just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure the committee heard that and it was for the record, so thank I you. appreciate that. Thank you. Representative Clemens. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here, Mr. Dwyer. Thank good you to for see the you opportunity. Again. Yeah, good seeing you. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I think some people on this committee who are not as familiar with this program, I, I will say that we have had this program at Hillwood High School here in Nashville for several years. I've been honored to represent Hillwood High School. I'm unfortunately losing it with redistricting, but I can tell you firsthand what a difference it's made in the lives of, of students who've come through that program and have benefited from the great teachers and instruction in that program. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think the cost is about 1200 per student that goes through the program. Is that correct? That's correct. And so, you know, every student it benefits. This is one of those deals where you invest a little money and you save a lot of money in other areas where what could happen to these children? Where could they end up? What, you know, how could they end up in the system costing this state a lot more money? And so a few years ago, I guess it was about two years ago, I want to say probably during the pandemic or before, Several of us worked across the aisle because some funding was up in the air during budget time. And several of us on both sides of the aisle worked together and got that in the budget to make sure this valuable program continued. And I and I agree, it is apolitical. It is this is nothing partisan about this. This is a sound investment that has a proven benefit, percentage wise and personal wise. And so I, I thank you for the work you're doing. I thank you for our educators including Representative Haston's mom. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I would just encourage the committee members who don't know about this program to please take the time to learn more about it and work to bring it to your county if it's not already there. Because all these gold counties and these red counties deserve the benefits of JTG. And the money is 100% worth it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well said. Uh, Representative Chairman Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir, for being here. Thank um, you. I guess the first question would be out of the 17 counties last year, roughly how many students were involved with that total? We serve about 600 seniors and then there's 12 month follow up and we had about 700 uh, uh, in follow up. So you could say 1300 um, in the total program because we do track them from June of their right after graduation until May, once a month, check on them to make sure they're buying the books, getting their scholarships, getting a job, getting a better job, leaving a job with dignity. Um, so I'd say about 1300. Now, this program can be scaled very quickly. It was done in Indiana from about eight programs to 150 uh, during Governor Pence's time there. And so it, it's not as if it can't be scaled quickly. And I can tell you, uh, and because we've met before, you know, targeting Haywood, uh, we are, we are blue oval rific. I mean, there's those, those donut counties as well. If we could get this program in there to create a workforce with those that don't necessarily want to go to a four year school, I think this is absolutely the time to strike. So, um, I hope that answers your question. Follow up. It does. And thank you for that. The, the next question I would ask is kind of go into a little bit is a one year program begins in mm -hmm. August, ends at the end of the year, an hour. I mean, I mean, is an elective. How does that work with most of the schools? You're it doing? is a one credit course general elective that was unanimously approved by the Board of Education back in 2016, uh, endorsed by the Department of Education. We are a third party vendor with them. And it all depends on the delivery system, the schedule, the curriculum of the high school. There are some high schools where they're on block schedule. So our Hickman County specialist does East Hickman one semester and Hickman County the second semester. Uh, that's just the way it has to work there. So it's a condensed program. Does it still have a great effect? 
Um, yes, it does. So uh, we do it either in semesters. It's really better to have it the full year so you can kind of take some time, do a deeper dive into the competencies, do more project-based learning. Uh, so optimum, it's August through May. But uh, And we also have multi-year programs. If there's a school superintendent that truly believes this should hit earlier, we absolutely have the JAG model for that. What was inherited to me in 2014 was it was a senior only with 12-month follow-up. Thank you. And I'm sitting here putting pieces together, too. Your, the, uh, on the front of the brochure, it says the mission to identify students who face barriers to graduation. Uh, identify them on the early, before they graduate. I know we had, we've had bills in the past. You know, we have Tennessee Promise. So we spend a lot of money there, yep. but we have trouble keeping them in once because there are barriers. So we can identify it on the high school years. We may not have to spend the money on the uh, after high school years. Uh, one example of that, uh, Representative Clemens was was good to point out, $1,200 preventative. We actually ran a few years ago, we were granted an out-of-school uh, WIOA grant because the money flipped from WIOA to WIOA to out-of-school programs. Well, we graduate folks. We're an in-school program. They actually accepted out of a workforce alliance in, in Clarksville, and I'm grateful. But we ran a program to graduate eight uh, dropouts, and the cost per program per student to get there and earn their high set was more than $3,500. Now, do you want to pay $3,500 after the fact where you know they're ceiling at 18, 19, 20 years old? They've mad, made bad decisions. They've made parental decisions. Uh, I'd much rather pay it up front at $1,200 and see that paid back and have them a taxpayer. Most of these students that we, we deal with in August, they think their potential is here. 76% of our students believe they're going to graduate high school. They don't even believe in themselves. And then in May, the light goes on. They have a plan. They have a mentor in their life who follows them for 12 months, their favorite teacher. So the preventative versus paying for it after the fact with all that federal money from we, I just never understood it. And by the way, we didn't graduate eight people and get their high set. It was 28 under that grant. We really under promise over delivered. And I'm very proud of that, but I much rather get them when they're 16 and 17 than 18 or 19. Absolutely. Thank you. Members, anyone else have a comment of our guest? Well, thank you very much. Members, this, these are two programs that as we make decisions and legislation coming forth, wants to be aware of so that we can make wise decisions on how we're uh, spending state money. Kirk, may I just say, uh, I went to Butler. So Hoosier as well. Okay. We have a basketball program. Yeah, did you know that? <laughs> you recognize it's, it's any of that's better than Mickey Williams, who's a Florida grad. Okay, we'll just say that. Yeah, we still can't break her that habit, can we? No. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Okay, I really appreciate thank you it. so very much. Members, Any anything else? Or any objection to adjourning? Hearing none, we're adjourned.